Welcome, Sora Media viewers. Uh, welcome to the leading Indo Western media platform today with Sora Magazine, podcast, and other media platforms. My name is Soham Conley. Today I'm joined by Dr. Vanu Conley. And today we're continuing on part two of our UC Davis Health uh, story. And today we're joined by the CEO, one of the 100 most influential leaders in healthcare in America today, Dr. David Labarsky. How are you doing, sir? Great. Thank you. We are so fortunate to have uh, David with us and uh, Swara Media patrons and Swara Media readers, viewers. Uh, we are going to have an exciting next 30 to 45 minutes and uh, it is going to be a very uh, informal uh, conversation. And I'm going to represent your questions and uh, address some of your uh, issues that related to healthcare and uh, getting directly from David so he's a most influential and a very successful healthcare leader and uh, Sacramento County, Greater Sacramento, fortunate to have us. And uh, he's uh, gifting us this time to us. And uh, uh, thank you. Let's we'll get into first question here. And uh, we are going to exchange in between both of us the questions. Uh, David, how do you uh, say the journey for the last few years since you have come from UC Davis? Can you paint as a macro picture where uh, UC Health is currently uh, from your uh, viewpoint? Well, first and foremost, um, we'd be nowhere without our doctors and nurses. Uh, they're the most dedicated group I've ever had the privilege uh, to work with. Um, and they're the cornerstone on which we're building the future. Right now, we've really shifted to make sure that we're fulfilling the needs that this region has. A destination healthcare center doesn't require you to travel anywhere outside of our region to provide all the care that anybody could possibly want at an extremely high quality. And the second thing is that we're not in competition with anyone else. We've set out on a philosophy that UC Davis Health is here to complete and not compete with any other healthcare entity in the region. We offer a different level of care and a different level of subspecialization that complements, does not replace the very critical infrastructure we find around all of our local communities. And in taking that position, we have found and been greeted with open arms with people we used to think we were in competition with. So that's number one, is making sure we're fulfilling the goal of our organization, which is to bring the highest level of care into this uh, region. The second macro issue is about building. The campus is undergoing a generational change we have the largest uh, building project and the largest building program in the entire United States of America. We currently have $6 billion worth of construction ongoing on this campus, the largest hospital tower uh, that will quadruple the number of ICU beds we can offer this region, very important following the pandemic. Um, a tech hub that will foster uh, entrepreneurship and cutting edge innovative uh, small companies and the largest ambulatory surgery complex in the United States of America as well, all going up as we speak. And in a couple of months, we'll be opening up a brand new dedicated rehab hospital, Sacramento City's only such uh, facility and something that's been needed in this region for quite a long time. So what we're really trying to do is fill the niche. But that's the current niche. The other part of this is while we're building all of these facilities and all of these great places, we're building a truly virtual and digital capability that's second to none. Um, I believe you've had the opportunity to speak with our Chief Digital Health Officer, Dr. Right. Ashish Atrija. It's an amazing asset to this organization where we are now considered at the top of the nation in terms of the infrastructure we've built. Of course, that doesn't mean very much to patients, but it does mean a lot to patients when we start using it in order to connect with different communities. And we drive equity into healthcare when we allow people to get care where they want it, 
how they want it, and when they want it. And don't force them to wait on a doctor's visit to get the information or uh, some of the advice that they may need uh, in between an office visit. So we're really pushing forward on that digital realm to really complement all of the facilities that we're building. David, uh, a lot of our viewers, um, at least 20, 30 percent of viewers, had uh, part or segments of this question. I want to hear from you to see how best we can uh, alleviate anxiety or the fear that our, our readers and our viewers have. David, they have asked me that why does it strikes fear in the hearts of the community members or particularly our community members when they think about health or their health care needs or in a health system? Is it because you think it is pertinent to Asian community or is, do you, in your experience, is it generally the case? Is it financial or its lack of trust or its complexity? Uh, I was, uh, being a doctor, I was surprised that would be the first question or the topmost question that they would ask. And I felt obligated that I would bring it to you and get a, a clarification or get in a viewpoint why it strikes fear in the hearts to the members who are supposed to feel better uh, rather than uh, feel fear. From okay. David, what do you? I think that it's a great question, and uh, you actually gave all the answers. It's you're right, and you're right, and you're right. Okay, which it, it's all of the above. But you know, I'm going to start at how we approach healthcare in this country. Is very often it's not about healthcare, it's about sick care. And so when people think of the hospital, mm. think about going to the doctor, they're not thinking about how do I prolong my life and get the most out of every single year that I have and, and get the most out of all the time I'm gonna to get to spend with my family and my loved ones. Now they're thinking about trying to survive a very difficult event. And so of course that would bring fear into most people's minds because they're not associating visiting the doctor or interacting with the health system as a way of making their life better, but just making it less bad, right? And will it turn out okay? It's not more of a wellness, it is a sick care. Yeah, on the positive side, you know, I, you know, we're one of uh, an amazing number of level one trauma centers around the nation, you know, that serve people who've had a severe traumatic injury. And we are considered an outlier by CMS, the Center for Medicare Services, um, as being the really the best trauma center in the United States in terms of our outcomes. Amazingly, amazingly good care. But that's not enough, right? Because we also want to make sure not only that you survive a terrible traumatic incident, but that you return to your life as fully restored as humanly possible. Same thing with a stroke. We're one of the highest rated comprehensive stroke centers in the United States. Our outcomes are superior. But again, it's not about surviving the stroke. It's about returning to your family as whole as humanly possible. And that's where building our new rehab hospital is so important mm -hmm. because that will be about achieving the highest level of recovery, not just survival. So hopefully, that will alleviate some of that anxiety. Like, why am I so afraid to go? Knowing that we have a full range of care that will restore people as close as possible to the way they were before. Outcomes that matter to patients are not prevalent enough in the way we measure ourselves. And we're working very hard on trying to do that. But then wellness is critically important too. And we have started by engaging in our, with our local communities, especially those that surround uh, our medical center, very disadvantaged communities. And we have what's called an anchor institution mission. And in that, sick care is a very little part of it. We're really trying to promote well care. We're trying to get cancer screenings into communities that generally don't have access to that. We're working with high school students to encourage them to seek not only a doctor or a nurse's job, but any of a number of great careers in our health system or health systems in general by exposing them to those opportunities at a young age when they can make really good decisions. Then all of a sudden, the health system is not something to be afraid of but something that you're allied with, right. right? And promoting behavioral changes by uh, holding seminars and, and, and food markets with fresh foods in, in communities that may not have access to that. Right. So we think that these are really critical parts of getting rid of that anxiety, which is frankly normal for anyone, and maybe more so for immigrant communities because they're also worried about not being understood. And that's something that UC Davis really prides itself on our ability to provide what's called class, culturally and linguistically appropriate services that embrace people for who they are, 
for who in the context of their familial and community situations and tries to craft therapies and recovery plans that take into account who an individual is. And, and I think that we're succeeding in, in great part with that. Um, we've been recognized as a sort of a great place for minorities of all types to come and receive care here because they're treated as they deserve to be treated, which is an individual, unique, and valued human being. This is a master class, and uh, my next question you kind of answered. My next question was, a uh, uh, lot of them asked, uh, does UC Davis really believe in uh, cultural competency and linguistic competency? Uh, because without the culture, nutrition, and language understanding, our uh, community believes that the healthcare delivery is going to be difficult. And uh, do you want to elaborate a little bit on initiatives of uh, cultural competency that you are instituting at a training level, uh, doctors at training level to doctors who are practicing level? And what about understanding not only the culture and traditions, but also the nutrition and behavior? For some of our patients, South Asian community like Vietnamese, some of the Indians, the life is uh, imminent and uh, it is a fairly well accepted phenomena. They would like to be respected that they would like to die at home uh, rather than con you know, taking a lot of uh, uh, resources and end of life care. So do we have a team that uh, at a UC system that uh, helps to build it and to propagate it? Or, or can you elaborate a little bit so this may help uh, decrease the anxiety that uh, they are not foreigners when it comes to taking care uh, at UC Davis, sir? Right. Well, that's a great question. Um, I'll say that I'm very lucky. I have a uh, very close friend. Uh, who's Vietnamese, and uh, she's first generation, and uh, her family, both her grandparents and parents, are, are here um, in the Elk Grove community. Yeah. And I've learned a lot about things I never knew in terms of cultural competency, um, just by listening to to uh, her talk about her family. And, and then on the other side of it, there's a professor here who uh, works in the Alzheimer's world, uh, Dr. Wayne Meyer. And she and I both served, also uh, Vietnamese, and she works in the Vietnamese community, and we both served on the governor's task force for Alzheimer's. And I actually didn't know until recently that actually the in the Vietnamese language, there is no real word for depression and Alzheimer's, okay. even though they're human beings, right, and they are experiencing those things, the culture doesn't really highlight that. So it provides an opportunity in understanding that we have to be asking questions in a different way when family members come in, because maybe they might not be as open about the deficits that their that their grandmother or their parent is experiencing um, in terms of their mental health, because it isn't widely discussed. We have to know that to provide good care, and we are really working on that. I think again, we've been heralded uh, by uh, HHS and Secretary Javier Becerra for our sensitivity, especially to the Hispanic and African American communities. But that extends actually to all. All, all underserved communities, all communities either new or previously marginalized in America, we really care about that. And I think that we do a great job, not because we can't do a better job, we do a great job because we believe that that's a good job to do. Excellent. One of the uh, most concerning uh, thing, uh, maybe it's in a bit political, but uh, the diversity and the inclusivity and the integration equity is on a lot of people's mind uh, from corporate world to healthcare centers to many other uh, politicians in a sense. Does UC Davis really believe in uh, diversity and equity and inclusivity? And if so, David, that uh, what measures or what actions that uh, uh, you are taking or you can start with whether you you believe or you don't believe a either way but i think it's okay but uh, what is your belief on that and what actions you're taking david right so um don't tell a small story because i think stories are always sure, good always our viewers um, love that I, I was an anesthesiologist and i was running a very large anesthesia training program in miami when some studies came out that said that anesthesiologists um you know, didn't provide the same amount of narcotic pain relief to African Americans as they did to other individuals in the operating room. And I find that impossible to believe. I, I just was I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I, everybody I know is a good person. They, they're not biased. They're not racist. And yet it was true. 
And we find that that still persists today, that, that sometimes people are undertreated because of who they are, the color of their skin, or the tone of their language. And ever since I did that, I should publish a paper. I said, can't be. At least I was working in a county hospital. Couldn't be in my own practice. And we looked at our perioperative clinic, which was run by our surgeons and our anesthesiologists, and how we treated people who had an old heart attack. And we found that, sure enough, people who were from underserved communities had less often prescribed the best treatment for someone who had an old heart attack. Couldn't believe it. Because if you talk to any one doctor, they would say, no, no, I give each patient what they should have. But yet we did it. And ever since I actually did that own research myself, which is almost 20 years ago, um, I have been a firm advocate that we have to look beyond our intentions and look at our results. And we are doing that. And um, just to give you an idea, a couple of things. Um, we're always considered by Forbes among the top employers for diversity okay. um, in terms of how we treat uh, people who love differently, the LGBTQ plus community. The Human Rights Watch Foundation came in and gave us a perfect 100 score for how we treated both our patients and our employees in terms of, of inclusivity. Um, we're privileged to actually make everybody in our organization feel welcome, and in return, they make patients feel welcome. So we are really, really committed uh, to this ideal. And I'll just close by saying our director of diversity, equity, and inclusion happens to be Vietnamese as well, South oh, Asian. Yeah. And um, a lot of people looked at that and said, well, they're not, you know, they're, they're not really minorities. Like, yes, actually they are. And, and, and you don't have to actually be from a particular minority to care about all minorities. And I think that's the most important message, which is that we care and we are going to treat you and understand your cultural heritage as much as humanly possible so that we can get the best medicine for you and your situation on a personalized level. David, there are some chatter uh, around the corners that uh, if uh, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusivity to be uh, incorporated into organizations like such a large organization like UC Health, would there be a possibility that means there is a competency, efficiency, and uh, skill being compromised or you're not worried about it? So nothing is more important than the quality of care we deliver to our patients. Question is, does diversity and inclusion increase the care that people get or decrease it? It's very clearly shown that when patients trust their physician and trust that their physician understands the situation from which they come, They'll actually follow the advice the physician gives. They'll take the medicines that are prescribed. So number one, you're more effective if you can associate and, and, and empathize with the communities uh, that you're treating. So in that way, we give better medical care. On another note, you talk about research. Again, we are the number three medical school in the United States of America for diversity. 67% of our students are socioeconomically disadvantaged. We graduate the most Hispanic students as a percent of our class of any medical school in the United States of America and embrace minorities not only for their MCAT scores, with their, their qualifying scores to get into medical school, but for the life experiences that show a devotion to the care of other human beings. And we think those people, not people who just memorize things well, make the best doctors. But then you say, well, what about that? Where's the brilliance? And the answer is, it's in everybody, and it shows in different ways. And it's very clear there, uh, across other industries, boards that have diversity in them perform better financially. Research teams that include diversity in their author list are quoted more often because the results that they produce perhaps are more universal, and the explanation of their results more meaningful to larger groups of people. So does diversity hurt excellence, competence, quality? I would say 100% no, it improves it. Well said, sir. That's a great segue. As in a most respected, well-regarded, uh, 100 most influential healthcare leader, we are in a cross-section of where technology emerging, mental health is raising, costs are raising, quality has become a conundrum to address. Uh, we have a future uh, medical student here sitting, Soham. And uh, Soham, uh, this is a, what a privilege. And particularly, this is uh, very important at a community level. 
a lot of our south asian families uh, culturally we believed for many many years and we continue to you know becoming in a doctor and an engineer is kind of uh, needed to be and uh, to reach a lot of families we said about an a future leader and current leader interact and so that our families can enjoy this conversation and uh, thank you so much david for uh, giving such an a privileged access and uh, your time for uh, this discussion uh, uh, so i'm take away from here so to begin i want to say also thank you i found a lot of your answers to be very insightful and as per the future of people within our community or any immigrant community in general in terms of profession one thing to continue the continuity from the previous uh, uh, episode with dr treja is people can be leaders in any profession and what that means is empowering people from every community each community each minority group to represent something like uh dr labarski said you don't need to be from that minority to be an ally to all minorities and i think to amalgamate some of the concepts that dr labarski mentioned i want to start by talking about one important uh piece that we were talking about uh and combining it with our initial topic which was accessibility and quality of care and what that means for not only a growing youth population as patients but also growing students and learners in medical field technology field etc and beyond and so my question comes to this when establishing longitudinal care as a young patient or understanding how to bring longitudinal care as a future medical professional how can doctors or leaders in this healthcare setting begin to break open the closed circle of medicine that's there and start to hammer away at that circle to really build access points in order to really make sure that patients are aware that quality of care is really the priority as opposed to quantity of care that's a great question unfortunately you know we live in a society where in many cases um <clears throat> quantity of care drives reimbursement right so people you know people don't go to work and i have never met a physician in my life who goes to work thinking well i'm just going to do more work that i don't need to do right but you almost convince yourself that well you know what this could help and also helps me too right, right? and so the way that you get at that is with alternative payment models and by that we mean value based care where you say hey here's $5000 you take care of that person no matter what they need and if you do that across a large enough population it all works out and everybody gets exactly what they need when they need it where they need it and how they need it because people figure out well I'm getting x number of dollars how do I get the most care to that person that I can we're not quite there yet universally but medicare advantage works pretty well in that regard um as do some other value based uh arrangements where you get a set fee and you're you just got to provide the care that needs to be provided it actually is innovation provoking as well because instead of just having to see somebody you can actually have a lot of digital interactions which are quicker more focused um and actually are equity driven in the sense that you don't have to take a whole day off from work right and some a lot of people don't have paid time off to go and sit in the doctor's office you know for 17 minutes of their advice but you've wasted a whole day right right that's actually really important for people from underserved areas who could use 100%. their lunch time or their break time to get the information that they need so part of this digital infrastructure that we're building is going to promote that which is self triage meaning self identification of a problem the delivery of self care where it's simple and straightforward digitally enabled self care like okay i have a rash i don't really know what it is I'm going to go and 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 access a program that will look at my rash and tell me do I need to see a doctor or do I just need to put some cortisone cream on it. Right. And then if I need to see a doctor to get some clarification, do I have to walk go into the office or I can just do that over a digital interface? Right. Can I wear a special pair of glasses so the doctor can actually see yeah. exactly what I'm looking at? Right. right? There are glasses that already exist that yeah. like that. Yeah. And then eventually going up the chain so that the low value work that means things that don't really require really physician decision making and analysis and explanation are done on a digital realm. Right. And I think that's where we're going and we have to train our future physicians how to operate in that world. And you know we'll talk about AI later but that will help drive out of our system this low value work so that doctors have time to have a discussion about more complex problems with their patients when they need that type of advice and not feel rushed. Right. So to clarify 
the future of healthcare and the future of bringing value-based care, as Dr. Lubarsky mentioned, would require us to integrate digital tools to minimize the current inefficiencies in the healthcare system by having doctors prioritize the time that they can spend with patients of any single creed to allow them to take any dollar amount given to them to really use it how they see fit to bring that level of care. And that leads me to my next point, which is holistic treatment is important. And as Dr. Conley mentioned, when you have so many factors of holistic treatment to look at, we begin to ask, can we really target all these aspects equally and with enough care? Are we spreading ourselves too thin? And one important aspect in every community, but particularly stigmatized in South and East Asian, Southeast Asian communities is mental health and what that goes into uh, of being a patient, being someone who lives, uh, health is longitudinal, disease is continuous, and sometimes that's not you know remembered. It's not just acute problems, people have chronic problems, and mental health is a big part of that. And now we know from current research that having a digital footprint can sometimes negatively correlate to mental health. And the more digital we go, as we've seen through the pandemic or through social medias, et cetera, et cetera, will that have an adverse impact on mental health? And if so, how can prestigious institutions and not only institutions, but landmarks of the community like UC Davis Health kind of reassure patients and show them that we care about mental health because mental health and physical health they work hand in hand. Those are great questions. And I think our entire society has for a very long time underestimated the impact of mental health, not only on human well-being, Absolutely. but on economic Absolutely. productivity. Right? You, you, don't, you don't get anything done if you're so depressed you're laying in bed or, or you've lost your appetite and you're not strong enough to perform labor, right? right. So there's a real imperative, right, just, you know, to keep the world running, if you will, to address that. But more importantly is the suffering right. that you've talked about. You know, mental health is stigmatized for an, a reason that I entirely understand, right? In the Neanderthal days, right, if you couldn't function, you couldn't be with the tribe, you couldn't kill the mastodon or whatever, right? And it wasn't obvious why you weren't picking up your fair share. I think we've come beyond the cavemen, but, but our mentality hasn't really caught up, right? Which right. is, it's an organ in our body. We don't, we don't hate people who are blind. We don't hate people who get stomach cancer. We don't hate people, you know, who uh, twist their ankle and can't walk straight, right, for a while. Yeah, no. even deformities, we don't right. hate. But no, mental but illness. mental health has remained uh, curiously uh, in that realm. And, and I... I'm disappointed we haven't made more progress, but I think we're at the cusp because it's so prevalent. And when you start peeling back the layers, so many people suffer, not necessarily debilitating mental health issues, but they just suffer, whether it's from anxiety or some depression or episodic blue moods or mild degrees of, of, of dementia. And right. it's there. And we need to, number one, diagnose it. And number two, provide the treatment or supportive therapy that will ameliorate it. And um, it's interesting. While it's definitely been shown that envy and uh, online bullying can be a bad part of, of the media world, actually support groups and, and, and distant friendships and uh, talking to people who are like you, who are suffering in the same way, actually turns out to be positive. My, right. my daughter's a clinical psychologist hmm. with oh. PhD. So I, I hear all about this all the time. Right. Who, saw, who like focuses on like teen and tween angst, right? So I, I know more about this probably than I should. <laughs> um, and, but that's, so media isn't all that bad. Right? It is right. bad if you spend all your time envying someone else and thinking your life isn't good, which, of right. course, you never see the reality on, 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 the, right. on, the, on the social media. But it can also be supportive. And that's the part of digital health that I think UC Davis Health can help with, right? right. which is to help recognize the signs of mental health. Right? You don't even right. need to talk to a doctor. A lot of people don't want to talk to a doctor, but right. recognizing it for you and your loved one. Talking about how you can determine if you need to see a physician and whether you might benefit from additional therapy. And also following when you might have an episodic relapse. So whether it's your watch or your Fitbit or your iPhone, we can measure your gait, your steadiness, your speech patterns, the tone in your voice, your response times to a conversation. All these things that you know run through computers, 
will be able to tell us you're at risk of going down the wrong pathway. Let's intervene before you need sick care. Let's intervene so that we keep you well. And that's the, if you will, the, the, the pot of gold at the end of all this technology. Excellent. It tells us before you get sick that you're headed that way so that we can do something before you do get sick. And that's the real goal. And it can do it in a culturally appropriately way. We can do it in a way because every single language is immediately available for translation into that native language on a digital device. You can't, your doctor is not going to speak 142 languages or how many countries there are these days, right? But the computer can. And it can do it even simultaneously. It can translate to English for the, uh, for one part of the family and, and, and to Indian or Vietnamese for another part of the family. And everybody can participate then in the conversation equally at the same time. So many opportunities here with digital health. And getting at mental health is really an important part of that because we have to bring it out of the dark. And by making it possible for people to find out information on a digital platform about it, it will help bring it out of the dark. People don't have to be, shouldn't ever be ashamed about looking on their iPhone to get information they aren't. And I think that will help spread uh, appropriate diagnosis and treatment. Wow, that was a really insightful answer. And I think a power of the way that you're explaining these things is something that I should be more widespread in the way that information is important when it's understood by a majority of people. And sometimes in healthcare, technology, any sort of sector, any place where people strive for progress, strive for innovation so much, they forget to represent what their work means to a general audience. So I wanna thank you for being able to zoom out and give us that perspective. And in that same way, I wanna ask a question from a future medical professional standpoint. And one of the things I really believe in as a part of my education and as a part of caring about patients is the ability to believe and trust and utilize story or narrative medicine or whatever thing you wanna call it, but in my exploration of this topic and uh, understanding how diversity, equity, inclusion, etc., cultural competence, all these things come into play, uh, we have to understand three main frameworks. And this is two of the frameworks are frameworks proposed to understand new technologies in healthcare. And that's technical framework and ethical frameworks. But the third framework I wonder about in the context of incorporating holistic care is the practical framework. A lot of times in the classes or seminars or a part of college colloquiums at medical school curriculums abroad, we hear an emphasis on all of these things and I don't want them to become buzzwords. I feel like that would be a fear for most providers, people like you, your daughter, my father, many medical professionals who legitimately care about these people but are lost in the growing field and as a future provider, how can we practically incorporate these things and spend the time that we may or may not have with patients to really elevate the quality of care. Right. Well, so there's a great book that was written a few year, years ago called Compassionomics. And it talks about the economics of compassionate care. And one of the most important things, of course, isn't only the care you deliver, it's how patients feel. Right. about the care you deliver. And again, that goes to being an effective physician by getting people to listen to what you have to say. Um, and it turns out it only takes 38 seconds yeah. to actually make a patient feel like they're being heard. Wow. And that 38 more seconds than we routinely spend, if we just don't cut them off and we leave them some time to answer open-ended questions about their story. And that's what you're talking about, right? right? And then we use in our teaching mechanisms our stories. Because I can quote statistics till you're blue in the face, right? Exactly, yeah. I got all these, you know, <laughs> floating around in my head. But, but at the end of the day, a single patient's unique story and how either technology helped them or intervening on behalf of their parent who was feeling blue and how a visit to a mental health professional and a small amount of medication turned their life around and what it meant not only for that patient but for their whole family and for their loved ones, that story is infinitely better. 100% then anything I tell you about, this drug's 80% effective, we just no, give it now, 100%. right? That doesn't touch your heart and it doesn't touch your brain. And that's why storytelling in human history exactly. has been the mechanism by which culture has flourished. It is not by quoting statistics. Correct. Yeah, from 
a, a psychology perspective, Dr. Labarsky talked about the MCAT scores for any future medical, trying to be medical students or pre-med students. And a lot of what we think and how we remember, I want to bring uh, importance to is not rote memorization. That is not our best form of memory. Our best form of memory is cued recall, which means attaching a certain topic to a story. And as professionals, I think that's an important uh, piece. And I thank you for introducing that practical aspect and how that can be introduced. Back to Dr. Conlon. Thank you, David. I'm pretty sure our listeners, our, our viewers, and our readers are going to be enjoying uh, this conversation. Uh, we are going to get into the final segment of this conversation. David, there is recent uh, Kaufman and Hall, Deloitte, uh, PricewaterCooper, a uh, few other organizations have uh, published data that 52% uh, of all hospitals are running either red or margins are decreased. What would you say the post-COVID challenges and why so they have performing economically not well and is it the culture of hospitals and healthcare centers are heads and beds a story or where is a value-based care this is an amalgam of a lot of questions but uh, you can take whichever the way you want to take start from why we are losing money to where the value-based care would come in or this all fits into right and uh, you feel free to add solutions or your comments and uh, please uh, enlighten our viewers. Sir. Well, I'm going to start with a not very original thought, um, which is, uh, and I'm going to misquote Albert Einstein, but I'll, I'll try anyway, which is that if we want a different outcome, we have to start thinking differently than the thinking that got us where we are, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. And so if we, what we're doing right now is we're just a hamster on a treadmill, running and running, running faster and faster. People need healthcare. The population is growing um, and uh, we have a shortage of healthcare professionals, and even if we didn't, they're a little burned out, and um, many of them are either quitting or taking time off, which exacerbates the problem. So in terms of just a very simple thing of why are health systems struggling today, um, there's a lot of demand. There aren't enough nurses and often physicians, uh, but mostly nurses, and we're not producing enough nurses, and they have to hire and basically bid for nurses. So the organizations who lose nurses, they can't provide care and they're really not doing well. And the organizations that win the bidding, they're providing care at a loss. So everybody is losing. And it's not, it's, nurses are extremely valuable. It's not their fault. Right. It's just we haven't produced enough nurses to fill the need. So number one is, the answer is we have to have the right number of people, right, to take Starting. care of us. And then we have to start thinking, or do we just need to provide care in a different way, which goes back to the digital revolution. Someone just did a recent study that they were talking about that nurses only spend 37% of their time providing the high level value interactions, the care and the compassion, which they are so excellent, and the, their evaluation of your recovery process. That's important. But charting is like a third of their time, and another third of their time we're doing tasks that frankly don't require an RN's degree. So if we could just get nurses and stop bothering them to do stuff that doesn't add value, maybe we'd have enough nurses yeah. to rethink how we allocate tasks and patients. So that's number one. But that's been, mostly it's been labor issues. There's plenty of volume, especially the higher level organizations, meaning UC Davis, UC San Francisco, Stanford, um, the, the really busy uh, big hospitals. They're filled, we're filled to the brim. We've never been busier. Um, and we're very lucky. We're very, the, the current nurse turnover rate in the United States, 21%. Right. One out of every five nurses moves or quits every year. Correct. Uh, at UC Davis, we've only been about 7%. Oh. Uh, we're about the best in the nation. And that is because we invest in our nurses. We invest in our workforce and we have career paths for them um, where 61% of our nurses, the highest in the U.S., have specialty certification in their area, okay. like pediatrics or OB or trauma. And that means they like their job better. They like their colleagues better. They feel more meaningfully a part of the team. And we've invested a lot in that in achieving magnet status, which is uh, the highest level of kind of nurse professionalism that you get awarded for. And we think that's the right way to go, right? So in terms of how do you make money? Right. Well, first you actually create a great workforce and you let them do what they're meant to do. 
and we maybe need to change how we're thinking what they're meant to do, but I think we're on the right pathway, which is everybody has to feel like they are the integral part of the team. Every single employee, whether they're environmental services or food service workers, or pharmacists, nurses, doctors, they all need to feel like they're part of a greater purpose in life, which is to deliver the care that our community needs. Great. So. Very well said, David. One other question from our community providers is, uh, particularly our friends, uh, uh, South Asian community. There's a large South Asian community providers present in Sacramento County, which is almost 28%. Uh, not a lot of them realize that. And uh, so they have asked a specific question. Kaiser is a closed unit uh, for the outsiders participating. And uh, more and more others are becoming like that. Uh, does UC Davis have any plans to collaborating, bridging, to the community physicians and needs. They may be independent, they may be small organizations. Recently, I've seen with uh, Jonathan Porteous, uh, uh, you guys uh, come to launch some specialty care initiative that is uh, extraordinarily commendable. That means to our viewers, the UC Davis level of specialty care could be available, accessible to a safety net clinics through WellSpace, it's a very profound, it has not really gotten as much as uh, mileage it's supposed to get. But I think, uh, do you have more plans like that or do you only take a look at a large organizations like WellSpace uh, uh, to do community partnerships? Traditionally, um, that was not the case and is there change in the view or where is uh, UC Davis going and can you elaborate? David? Right. Well, as I said, we really want to be a partner to everybody who's providing health care in our region and uh, without regard to who the doctor is or the type of practice that they have. Um, it is true. We're really, really busy, right? And so what we've, and our, our clinics are filled, the waiting times are too long and, um, and we're working on that so that we can be better partners. Uh, believe me, it's in everybody's best interest that we don't keep patients waiting. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the WellSpace partnership because it is fairly unique. It's a unique yes. model in the United States. Most safety net clinics only provide primary care. And then when they need, when their patients need specialty care, they're in competition. And frankly, um, a lot of practices uh, don't accept a lot of safety net patients in their right. subspecialty clinics. We do. We do. We always have. Yeah. But what this allows is... And it's hard for sub, for these uh, subspecialty safety net clinics to exist because they're not really associated with like the high level subspecialty care of an academic center. Right. By having our subspecialists who get to be UC Davis doctors but may rotate part of the time into a safety net clinic, they get the best of both worlds, right? To serve the underserved and to serve education and research for their own careers. And we think that's the right model and how academic medical centers can support everyone. And I just do want to point this out, this subspecialty hub that we're creating, and we started with rheumatology, but we have plans to add eight subspecial, different subspecialties, wow. is open to every single practice, meaning anybody. Well, it's not uh, definitely just for well space. No. Anyone can. Anyone. No, we have. So this is the second one we've done. We did one in partnership with Sacramento County, and we dealt with their patients and people who were uninsured and the homeless in that clinic. But people didn't feel as comfortable referring into the county clinic for whatever reason. And WellSpace, being the largest uh, safety net clinic, you know, structured this not for their benefit, but so that any of the other safety net clinics you know, could refer into this, and you know, the patients would speak at their subspecialty care and then be referred back to their original safety net clinic. So continuity of care was guaranteed. That's the, that's the purpose, and that would serve any independent practice who Fantastic. sees a patient and they go, wow, I, 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 this is a little bit beyond me. This rheumatology problem is a little bit behind, you know, beyond me. I don't know what to do about this inflamed joint. There's some place now to send them where they can get seen without, again, you mentioned the finances, without bankrupting the patient, right? right? And that's the most important thing. You know, I, I will just point this out because you did mention this. I've been here five years. I can say unequivocally and without a doubt, we have sued no one and sent no one into bankruptcy ever, at least in my entire time here. I can't speak before. I can just say in the five years I've been here, nor will we ever. There is no time we will ever send anybody into bankruptcy, right, in order to pursue a medical bill. 
it's, because it's wrong. It's a profound statement, David. It is uh, amazing. Our community knows and takes a notes of that. And those who are fearful about finances, the scale that you have, we have a friendly institution here, UC Davis Health Center. I think you can approach it with confidence and then have an experience different than what your heart is saying at this time. Right. You, and uh, oh, I'm just going to say, you can't be, you, 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 you're already sick. You shouldn't have to worry about whether you'll have a house to go home to, right? right. It's not okay. It's never been okay. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have to pay your bills. You don't have to work on a payment plan. We have a lot of charity uh, programs yes. that allow people who are, you know, who, who need help to get help. But the institution but it should is never not here be to come to that. Right. 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 It should never come to that. Never. And uh, as we are coming to the end, um, I briefly mentioned uh, with uh, the public relationships department and uh, uh, David himself about our community leaders, our politicians, and our uh, other uh, leaders in the major organizations like SMART, pg &E, and Intel have uh, requested me to see if uh, UC Health willing to do a town hall sometime uh, late spring or early summer or maybe fall. Uh, I definitely presented your wish to them and see what happens. I think uh, uh, hopefully we can do uh, a, a town hall and we have other physician leaders from South Asian community. Uh, we are going to showcase them uh, throughout and uh, Swara Media is going to be that partner for the UC Davis, uh, enriching, informing, educating, advocating our South Asian community. And uh, thank you, David, for your participation and uh, your time. And it's a very meaningful and it's only beginning our journey. And uh, hopefully we can, uh, Swara Media and its enterprise can partner with UC Health in coming years and uh, uh, keeping our community engagement, our social engagement, uh, be part of your social and community engagement. Soham, you have any closing remarks? To close this off, I think uh, I want to highlight a few important things that we talked about today. Uh, everyone feel free to chime in. The first one is mental health is not a joke and we do care about it from every perspective and in every community. Mental health is not a joke. The second point is, like Dr. Lebarski said, it takes 38 seconds for a patient to feel like they're hurt. And at UC Davis Health and other, hopefully other health institutions, there are physicians and there are healthcare providers that want to hear you. And finally, I think it's important to recognize that in every part of healthcare, we've been focusing a lot on health. But today, there's many institutions, including UC Davis Health, that also focus on care, which is in a part of healthcare that should not be forgotten. So thank you for taking the time to listen today. Thank you, Dr. David Labarsky. Thank you, Dr. Vanu Conley. And, uh, and that wraps it up. Then, David, your closing remarks and uh, are reflecting uh, on the community, on this interaction, and your commitment for our community uh, from both information and education, uh, please uh, close the uh, uh, meeting, sir. Well, I just want to thank you for inviting me and for the opportunity to speak to those who might be listening because they need to know that at least at UC Davis Health, and I think all my colleagues across this entire region, we care about every single patient. We care about every single person's health. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. You don't love your child less because you're from a particular community. You don't care less about your elderly parents' care because you belong to one culture or another. We all are the same in that way. And that's what we try and communicate in the care that we provide, which is we care about you, we care about your family, we care about your future, and we care about making sure that the advice we give you is both meaningful and actionable so that every community and every person is healthier at the end of the day. Thank you so much, uh, our viewers, and uh, thank you for watching us. Uh, thank you for encouraging us, and uh, thank you for being part of this uh, growing and uh, media house, Swara Media. Thank you. Thank you.